Welcome to the podcast. In today's podcast, we are going to be talking about why do men find it hard to go for what they want. Are you ready for this one, Pete? Yeah, absolutely. This is something that uh, I think just it's just a, it's a general question that we raise in AMP a lot. What the fuck do you want? And, oh. um, and every guy, every guy struggles to answer this. This is it's a fucking hard question, and it's a consistent question that is always evolving. And um, we've got a few. We've got five. Five areas we're going to cover today on why uh, men find it hard to figure this one out. Yeah, I think that if you're listening to this podcast, this is something that's coming up more and more uh, with with clients uh, and myself as well. You know, I think I definitely, uh, you know, I write this and I do reference my own experience when, when we do these um, and we talk about them and Pete can share in a second about him. Is like, I, I find that, getting really clear on what I want is the first step in any process of transformation. So if you're listening to this and you want to change your life, if you want to start accelerating your success, if you want to let go of stress, if you want to avoid that feeling that you're not going anywhere and you're going in circles, this is going to be a great podcast for you to listen to and go and take action on one of the things that we talk about as well, because I think that sometimes you can get get caught in the theory and not move into action. So let's just dive straight in. Do you want to, do you want to share anything before we get in there, Pete? Yeah, I'll, I'll share quickly here because I think this is important. And this has come up for me multiple times because like figuring out what the fuck you want is like there's so many areas. It's your relationship, it's your business, it's your overall purpose, it's um, you know your, your family like social it's there's so many areas to like figure out what the fuck do you want and like this is something that i always fall back onto is that for me personally it is absolutely about creating the man that i would admire and then bringing him into the world it is ultimately it is closing the gap between who i am now and who i know that i can be and consistently doing that so then that's like my oh that's like my over overdriving purpose that's that's the overarching thing. And then underneath that, there is all the subcategories of relationship and business and so on. But if, as long as I'm just consistently going towards that top thing, it helps me make decisions. Yeah. I also love that. I, like, it just reminds me of that, create the, create the man that your boy self needed. <laughs> it's just like, I think we've talked about that before. Okay. So let's just dive into the question, why do men find it hard to go for what they want? And, and I think to answer that question, why do they find it hard is I think that they've gone for things in the past and it's not paid off. So if you're a guy that struggles to articulate easily, this is what I want, that you've gone for something in the past, it hasn't come into fruition, you've failed. And the easier choice that you've made is just to tell yourself that you don't want these things anymore. And it's easier to create a narrative like, like that. It's like the um, living disappointed versus being disappointed. I'd rather live disappointed because it's it's a low level pain rather than go, being disappointed. Now, for example, like in a relationship, living disappointed is committing to singleville. You know, it's like oh, you know, I don't need a partner, and I know the pain of being lonely. And it's like a 10% pain that I, I I know that I can survive versus being disappointed, going up to somebody and them saying no to you. And that painful in the moment, seemingly, you know, hundred percent pain. I, I'd rather choose the, 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 the chronic disappointment than the acute disappointment. And I think that's something that a lot of guys, especially, and I, and I, I saw it in body transformation where guys would tell these ridiculous stories about being fit and healthy and that it wasn't for them or, you know, when they reached a certain age that they couldn't achieve it. And it was just a defense mechanism because they'd be, they experienced that in the past. Yeah. But also if they've experienced um, like pain in the past, like, okay, here's an example for me is on relationships, right? In my late, in my late twenties, I had my heart broken. It was the first time that happened. I'd, I'd managed to go until I was like 28, 29 um, for, to real feel like um, intimate 
painful love where I'd actually, I, I literally felt my fucking heart break. And um, it was horrible. And that um, was difficult for me to then move into relationships after that, thinking, fuck, do I want to go full in again and then risk that happening again? The, easy, the easier route for me is to not go full in, maybe just dip my toes in or stay single. Yeah. Oh, the first heartbreak is pain. It's funny, actually, like, because, like, my, my um, school girlfriend, I was with her for like, maybe three or four years. I was, and, like, really, you know, great relationship. And we ended, like, really nicely. It was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to uni. You're not going. Bye. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. And then, actually, in university, I had my heart broken. Oh, my God. It was excruciating. It was so painful. And um, actually flunked my year two physiology exam because it was, she dumped me the day before. And like my tutor came, like got me in and he said, Ben, like, what the fuck's going on? Like, because I was an amazing student. And he's like, dude, you've got like a D. Like, what the fuck is going on here? And um, I remember I was just like in agony. I couldn't think of anything else. Like, mm. you know, when you get your heartbreak, you can't think of anything else. What's, and like that um, pain- what- yeah, I was going to say, here's a question. It's completely fucking different to what we're talking about, but I think everyone will find this valuable. You, you give yours, I give mine. What's the one lesson that you learned from heartbreak? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, okay, have you got what, yours? I'll, I'll, I'll you, give, yeah, I'll you give mine, yeah, because it, it comes to me pretty quick. The, there's not loads of lessons, but here's like one of the core lessons that I learned from from heartbreak is that I should not try and control a relationship. Like when I look back at that first, that, 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 that relationship in particular, there were so many elements I was trying to control the relationship itself, elements of her. And, and then, and then when she broke up with me, I don't, I lost, there was no control. Right? And that was the really, really hard thing. I was like, shit, there's nothing I can do here to change this. Like I, I can't, I can't control, I can't manipulate this. I can't mold this. I can't do what I want to do with this. And uh, it was a huge, huge lesson for me as a man, as it's a young good, man. I, that's right. really good. Mine's come up. Mine's come now as you were sharing. Actually, um, mine's that you'll get through it. Like I remember thinking, I remember thinking um, in that relationship with my uh, university girlfriend and with my marriage when that kind of came to its head and, and ended. I was like, "How the fuck am I going to get through this?" And I remember like thinking to myself and like. Even now, like looking at my relationship I'm in and the, the love that I experienced with Poppy and the, the family union we've created with the kids, that far surpasses surpasses the romantic love that I had with with those previous partners. And actually, so that was a kind of a big one is that like there is more love out there. And that's that's like a big one for me because I I I did that, I definitely did over calibrate for a little bit. I was like, oh yeah, maybe I don't want this, but I allowed myself to get back into relationships. So this is like, you know, exactly what we're talking about here, uh, guys, is what what often happens is I could have, and Pete could have in those moments said, oh, you know what? I don't need a woman. I don't, yeah. And just told myself a story that I don't want a relationship. I'm just going to keep everything at arm's length and it's going to be easier. But, you know, I think, yeah, looking back, just actually a really good question there, Pete. Yeah, I've yeah. got, got another one here for business and let's just say that you you run a business and in the past you've employed people you've tried, you, right, you, yeah. you've, you've, you've grown your team and it hasn't worked out for whatever reason the team the team member has left um you, you or you just had bad experiences but they might have been a fucking great hire and then they've left or it might have been just loads of bad hires. Like, it's so freaking easy to make bad hires. You make more bad hires than you do good. Um, like I, I absolutely did um, for a long, long period of time. That there can then put you off, actually then go, do you know what? I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to bother growing the team. I'm not going to bother, like, growing the business because I don't want to hire any more people anymore. Because I've had I don't so grow. many shit people in the grow. past. Yeah, yeah, I think the root of that is you're telling something, I don't want to grow anymore. Yeah. And then, then the founder himself will become the bottleneck in the business because he's got that belief that if he's going to hire someone, but they are they're either just going to fucking leave or they're going to be a shit hire. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I again, I think it's like a defense mechanism. It's easier to tell yourself, oh, I don't want to grow. Maybe I should shrink. 
And it's just a total over calibration to not getting what you want and like a knockback. And so that's the first, and I think that's the first one in, in essence, it's like super irrational, um, calibration to sometimes just a, a, a small thing that goes wrong, like a bad hire or a, of one person in your team letting you down. And, and I think this is common. I think this is really, really common. Let's jump yeah, into the second I- one. Just to, just to, I think just to give um, everyone listening here a, a question, a bit of a tool to to ask themselves, because what we've discussed there, you can see on some scale that's, that there's some logic, but it is very irrational. In the long term, it's extremely irrational, like not to get into relationships that could have been hurt in the past or not to hire because we've had bad hires in the past. So um, a, a question that I will always ask myself and I'll and absolutely poise this to clients is think of someone that you know that has the success that you want in relationships or in business. That, that could be someone you know or it could be someone like a real figure. Let's say like uh, Elon Musk in business, for example. Right. In the same situation as you, what would they do? Mm. And it's just, and it's simply, it's just a, a, a very quick reframe. It's like, well, do you know what? Elon Musk isn't, isn't going to worry about <laughs> a couple of bad hires. That's not going to stop him from hiring again. Yeah, I think that the what we try to avoid is the pain of, of that experience. Going back to what I said before, is like the disappointment, the acute disappointment of failing, of failure, is what we try to avoid. It's the very thing that will grow us. Um, Okay. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Point number two guys is that the reason guys struggle to articulate what they want or get what they want is that they, what at some point they've played to win and then we play not to lose. And I can definitely see this. I can definitely see this with a lot of guys. I can see it in myself at the beginning of my business, I took shots. I just took action. I didn't overthink things. And I played as if I had nothing to lose because I didn't have anything to lose. I didn't have a reputation. I didn't have money in the bank at the time. You know, I actually made money really quickly when I was doing this, but I had nothing to lose. I had nothing to like, uh, you know, put on the table that was going to go. And then what happens is, as we accumulate perceived reputation, especially reputation, I think with this one, perceived reputation, because it's not even reputation, it's what we think about what people think of us. And that's quite a, a really point, a important point there. Our reputation is perceived. It's not, it's not what people think of us, it's what we think people think about us. And then what we do is we start holding back. Well, oh, do you know what? If I do this in my business, my clients won't like it. If I share my thinking about this, the wider arc of social media won't like me for it. So then what happens is we don't take the same risks we did at the start. And it's quite funny, actually, with with Facebook, how it brings up the history. I used to re- write some really polarizing, triggering posts around nutrition. And I look back and I'm like, gosh, I can't believe I wrote that. And it was, I, I just don't take the same risks anymore. I'm not as polarizing with my comments. And I think what happens is we get comfortable and we don't want to push into that pain, especially if we are, if it's risk and we don't want to lose as we see it's bad. We, we don't see the value of defeat because this is, this is the thing that when we play not to lose, we're scared of what we term as failure or defeat. Now there's so much value in defeat. There's so much value of not succeeding but we we see it as the worst thing Mm. and go on ultimately what you're talking about there is fear right so there's internal fears so fear of failure fear of success the fear of success one i was always like i I just fucking i never really understood that how can you have a fear of success? But then actually what you've just said there, like the fear of failure and fear of success ultimately comes down to judgment a, or a large part of that comes down to external judgment. And that, that judgment might be, well, if I get super successful, my family might judge me 
or my you know my mum might judge me my dad and maybe that that works for you maybe that doesn't but what might work for you because this t- certainly came into my world like the fear of success if I get super super successful like judgment from my tribe judgment from like my people even my team members even my colleagues even my partners judgment from my clients like would would I be forced out the tribe because I've overtaken them in terms of success so that so like it's and it's all down to fears so like the 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 not what Ben's initial point of playing playing not to win playing it safe can come down to these internal fears that we've got. And ultimately, it's a judgment from other people. Yeah, I think um, even with career change, like if you listen to this podcast and you're considering a career change, it's interesting that I've seen so many very, very, very successful people in Korea and they've wanted to become a coach or they've wanted to go and pursue something different. And they're like, oh, but I'm so worried about not making it. And I'm like your career is a testament to how you actually will make it. If you, like, Can you not see how you've already created success and you, you can go and do it again? And that's that self, um, self-assurance is that I love that mindset of like, take everything away from me, I can build it again. Mm. And, and that's like a really, really lovely mindset to have is like, okay, strip everything external away from me, I can go and build it again because the thing that built the external validation of success is within me it's not outside and you look at billionaires millionaires who go broke they quickly make that money back because of their skill sets are just inside them it's not and it's not the external money it's not the it's not the people it's their ability to go and create that again so i think it's a really important one yeah and And sticking on this because i think that we can delve into a little bit more here the now i'm thinking about it they play they play not to lose. This this could actually materialize like this. Say in, it's in your business or even in your, in your career, and we're talking about money and the amount, and the amount you earn. And the the internal paradigm might, might well be, as long as I'm paying the rent, as long as I'm paying the bills, I'm good. Like I just, I just got to pay the rent, just got to pay the bills. And that might even come from, like your childhood, like with your parents, just that, that, that they're always paying the rent, always paying the bills. And so the success to you internally might be, I'm paying the rent, paying the bills. And so, and then, and then, so it's, then what happens is if you do earn any more, it's like spend that or, 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 or you don't earn any more, just enough to consistently pay the rent, pay the bills month to month to month to month to month. Because that's the internal paradigm is that your level of success for you is it, winning is paying the is paying the rent yeah uh, actually as you're showing then um th- this is what i did with a client the other day is that we were talking about this this distinction playing to win them playing not to lose what got them to be successful was taking shots creating loads of different opportunities but i think at every point at, at a certain point in a, as a business owner you have to let go of some of the the things that you've got on your plate you actually get to a point, especially if you're at like a, a seven, six, seven figure mark, you actually have to do less. You actually have to let go of some of the hats you wear, some of the business ideas that you've got. It's actually about doing less. And playing not to lose is like we hang on to old things that don't serve us anymore. So playing not to lose is like, actually, I don't want to lose this. I, I don't want to lose this um, part of the business. I don't want to lose these these clients. And actually in 10x is easier than 2x it talks about that it's like a big part of growth for a lot of businesses is at some point saying well actually if we're going to be really successful we're going to have to stop serving this group of clients and when they do that their business takes off and it talks about various you know various examples of that and it's clear as day i think that in my previous business my fitness business i i hung on to some clients way too long I was like, well, actually, fast is, I used to say this to, to trainers, like fast is a rocket ship. If you want to be part of it, it's going places. You've got to change with the business. We can't be hanging on to old stories, patterns about how things were. We, and, and I think that was a big thing. It's like we, So playing not to lose can look like for you hanging on to old ways of doing things, old clients, 
Uh, and it's not about it's not about turning around and saying to your clients, oh, we're changing. Um, we don't want you anymore. It's like saying, hey, we're changing. Are you going to change with us? You know, that mm. can be, you know, especially for those of you who've got like, very long, long serving clients. We had to have clients that were willing to change with us. Yeah. Staying, staying on this because I've got another one here. The, the playing not to lose. One of the paradigms here, one, one of the internal um, beliefs here is that for me, for me to be super successful, I need to work fucking hard. And we, and we hear this a lot on, 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 on social media, you got work hard, work hard, work hard. Um, it, it may have even been drilled into you from your parents, like, like work hard. And so it can, it could feel like that you are undeserving, um, of, of building like substantial wealth because you haven't worked hard enough. It's like, well, when I, when I was younger, I saw my mum work like for 30 years just to get by. I like, I haven't done 30 years of work yet. So I, I've got to do, or my dad worked 20 years just to fucking, just to like support the family. He worked fucking hard. It, you know, my mum was working two jobs. That that's hard, that's hard work. I haven't done that. So until I, until I'm allowed to get, until I've, I'm deserved of earning that substantial wealth, I have to work hard. But the, but, but the internal barometer for working hard is something that is, could be pretty illogical. It's something that's made up and something that's subconscious. Could be. I think it very much is, right? <laughs> it's yeah. Just like... yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I see, but I see, see, you know, even in myself, right? I work fucking really hard. And I can see it in so many guys that come into the Awaken Man, the heroic, the heroic Man. They're all like, I need to work harder, I need to work harder, I need to work harder um, yeah. to, to, to earn the money. But actually, yeah. it's like, Hey, you can you can work super super smart. Like I, I've seen businesses go to seven figures like in a year, and then I've seen other businesses go to seven figures in ten years. Uh, and it's just like different markets, different times, different different forces, different luck, smarter working, and it's like all all these things come into it. And yeah, if you're not am... careful, you can fall into that. Oh, I need the I have to work hard over a long period of time to then be deserved of the the winning yeah uh, um this is bringing up a really good point actually i um went to a physio i told pete about this before i went to a physio yesterday and i remember when my when i was um he was a, like this guy was a strength and conditioning coach and physio and i my model was okay i charged 50 pound at that time for personal training which i thought was a lot you know i thought it was a lot per hour at that point in my life and i was like okay well actually if i get my strength and conditioning accreditation, if I get my master's, if I get my teaching degrees, then I'll be able to charge 55 pounds an hour or 60 pounds an hour. And that was my model of, so I had to do a lot of work <laughs> just to be able to charge 10 pound more. And actually I just like reflect on this. And as I was talking to the, the guy that was doing the work with me, I said, actually, yeah, I, you know, I probably charged 10 times what I charged 10 years ago. And, I was, and it just dawned on me when I was driving home. I was like, Oh yeah, I, I, my minimum fee is 10 times more than I was charging 10 years ago, thinking that that was a lot of money and I'm mm. doing less. And like, and that was for me, it was like, oh yeah, I have gone 10X. I have gone 10X in the last 10 years and, and some, like, and way some. And I was like, wow, that was a really, really nice little moment. And, and I think that like, that is from playing to win. I've, I've constantly looked at like, actually, I don't want to try and defend that rate. I want to continuously play to win. Um, and it, and I, can, I can see that. And I think if you're listening to this, look at, um, look at how some, sometimes we take a safe bet not to do that kind of 10 X. Like I'll play, I'll, oh, do you know what? I'll just go for the job just above mine in case I get the rejection or I don't get the actual work. So we, that's playing not to lose. Whereas playing to win saying like, well, actually where can I go and get five X my salary somewhere? Where can I go bold? Let's jump into the next one. Um, this one is like, Pete actually talked about this in, in the previous point, but, but what's happened is the reason you struggle to articulate what you want is you've been sold an idea of success by unsuccessful people and you've bought into it. And I think there's a two point, there's two points there is that either subconsciously or overtly, you've been sold an idea that success is bad 
it could be by the media it could be by your friendship group it could be by you know you you uh, you hang around with people that are anti establishment they don't like money they don't like capitalism whatever it may, it may be you've been sold this idea that successful people are a certain type of person they're arrogant selfish bad greedy all that sort of stuff you've been sold that idea but you've also bought into it so just kind of keeping it with 100% responsibility here it's not that you've just been told that by your parents and the people that have conditioned you. You've actually bought into this idea that success is bad. And I've had a number of clients who've said to me, yeah, I, I just I just don't want to be that, that quintessential salesperson that's greedy or trying to get m money from people. And what I think is going on here, and this really does put a lot of block, blockers on what you want, is that your model for success is in order for you to be successful, it's taking away from others. It means that if I have more, there's less for other people. Now, the, you know, Gay Hendricks talks about this in the the Big Leap. Is like, actually, when I am doing my best, when I'm working and outputting the best stuff into the world, and I'm getting success, it means other people are going to be more successful too, especially in, in the work that I do. So, I think this is something that you've got to be really mindful of. Like, who sold you the idea of success? Who told you about money? Who told you about what it means to be successful? And I think that's something I've got working with Yassine, like Yassine's model of success. He he just talks about wealth and success and money so easily. And it because it, he just lives and breathes it. And it, he's got no limitations on that. And that's what really attracted me to first work with him. He just really embodies that archetypal successful person that just wants other people to succeed and that and this is actually about pete so i was actually thinking about you in the in the lift the other day pete Not and the I was like, no pete no you don't graduate to the shower mate um Damn. that's i haven't transcended that's, yeah you haven't transcended to the shower but I, I noticed this about you pete pete wants other guys to win like i've never ever ever heard pete talk about that he wants someone not to win i've never heard you talk about that really like, and you notice that about successful people is you, you don't like truly successful people that have worked on themselves. Their model of success is when I win, you win. When I win, I want you to win more. And unsuccessful people, they have a finite view of success. Is like, if, if Pete wins, it means there's less success for me. Yeah, that's... um. If Pete wins, then there's less success for me. That, that, a lot, do you know a lot of that is this fucking ego. It's it's like it it come it comes from the ego, and it also comes from not having done the 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 inner work, the deeper work, the self development work, the, the the knowing that in this world there is so much, there is so much of everything. There's everything that we ever want. There's everything that we, we that we'll ever deserve. It's here, but to tap into that. To tap into that kind of like that universal spiritual side to know that the world is very, very abundant, you got to get a little bit woo, and and you and to and to do that, it's you got to kind of do the internal work and and set set the ego aside, and uh, that I think that's a massive that's a massive thing that many many guys will neglect for a long, long time because they're going, oh, I don't need anyone else, I don't need to tap into all that bullshit, um, I'll do this on my own, um, it's me against the world. And that's um, it's a flaw. I can tell you guys, it's a fucking, it's a fucking flaw. You get, you like, you, you, you got to change the paradigm on that. I had to, you know, there was a, there was a, there was a massive period where it was me against the world. Change the paradigm on that. You, you, you reap the rewards. Yeah, um, I think that a lot of guys see this also as a trade off. So the way that you might be, um, you might have sold this to yourself is that in order for you to get what you want it means being less of something else. So in in order for me to be successful in business, I have to have less of my time with my kids. I have to be less of a dad. I have to be less of a partner. I ha if I give love to, to one thing in my life, like my career, my passion, my hobby, it means I've got le less love to give to my family or, you know. And I, and I think that this is something that, I think it was Ray Dalio who talked about this, is like, how can you have and them both? And it's and that's kind of what I do a lot of in coaching is like just like well how can you have both and and, and it's, it's a really simple coaching question is like well 
I can see that you're putting this as a trade-off. How do you have both? And there's always a way forward. As Pete said before, there's always a way to get what you want. And the the reason you're perhaps not vying for what you want is you've just seen this trade-off as so painful. I don't, and I, I can definitely attest to this. I definitely can see that. It's like, oh, well, I actually, if I, if I become wildly successful, I'm going to have less bandwidth for the kids. And I'm probably still working through that because it's something that was such an important thing for me as being a dad. And so check in with that. Like, how do you see your model for success? And the final piece of this is that the, and I mentioned it before, that the archetypal successful man is arrogant, selfish, ambitious. And a lot of men are afraid of becoming that man. And you'll see guys, they will pause themselves before saying something that is seemingly arrogant. They will like say, oh, this sounds arrogant, but... Nearly all, and they all preframe it. I don't know if you've noticed this on calls. They'll uh, preframe yeah. being arrogant. I'm like, dude, this is a place to be arrogant. This is a place to blow your own trumpet. And you can see that that's a really, really big um, fear factor for them. Like, I don't want to be perceived as arrogant. And I'm like, well, what's wrong with a little bit of healthy arrogance? Yeah, well, again, it's judge- It's fear of judgment. Mm. It's all, it'll, it'll, yeah, so much of that comes back to that. So much of it comes back to the opinion of others. Yeah. So I'm afraid to go for what I want in case someone tells me I'm arrogant or selfish or ambitious. And actually, this is something that I've noticed is ambition is in a, in a lot of people's shadow. They are very, very, very um, worried about being perceived as ambitious, like a go-getter. Here we go. I got this recently from a book that I'm reading. And when I'm listening to it, when he said it, I was like, fucking hell, that is profound. So what Ben's just said there um, about guys being worried uh, that they're going to be perceived as arrogant if they speak up and say what they want. Again, it's something who's coming through consciously is like, that's that's what I want to fucking say. But hold, they hold off in saying it because they're worried about judgment from other people. Um, let, me, let me take the fucking big, big shot in business. I know the move I need to make, but I'm not making it because I'm worried about what other people might say or judge me. Ultimately, it's judgment, right? Um, Oh, there's there's the woman there's the hot fucking 10 out of 10 smoking chick from the matrix wet dress blonde hair i want to approach her um i'm not going to just in case um she says no and then i get judged and then i get laughed at and then whatever and people don't like me because of it or people don't like me because of what i've said and I, when i'm at the barbecue and i want to say that sort of thing here's the thing about here's the thing about life is that for us to fulfill what I said at the start of the call, our ultimate potential, close the gap between who we're being now and who we are meant to be, bring our best versions into the world, we, we're actually going to be disliked. And th- they're, like we're, we're, go- we're going to get it. And if you are not living a life where you are being disliked by some people, you are not living to your full. You're, you're really fucking not. And, and use it as a barometer. It's like actually, how many how many people are disliking what I'm saying right now, or what I'm doing, or how I'm acting, how I'm behaving? And I'm not saying go out there and be a complete dick. That's you, you know that's not what I'm saying. But go after what you want, and there's going to be some people that will absolutely love you and 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 praise you for it and push you forward, and there'll be some <laughs> that don't. Actually, funny enough, I, I messaged um, someone messaged me the other week. Um, well, who was it? It was a friend from home and um, and I went to reply to him and I, I wasn't a friend with him on Facebook anymore. And I was like, dude, just notice we're not friends on Facebook. Have you had a clear out? And he goes, mate, I unfriended you because I c- couldn't deal with watching your sunny videos in the morning. <laughs> and, it's like, and I was like, <laughs> he's like we're, still, we're still mates. And I was like, touche, absolutely great. And, and I actually realized that. And, and I felt I felt like it was a weird, it was a weird moment for me. I was like, oh yeah. I put these happy, you know, walking past the pool, sunshine in the morning in Dubai, Pete's living in Reading, you know, dreary Reading mornings. It, it will, it it's will trigger some people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's, you, you're dead on, you know, and I, I think I've been, I've been a little bit afraid of that in the past of like being disliked because I've had a few moments, a few times in my life where I've had that verbally said to me by people like, oh yeah, you, you, you've said this, it made me feel like this. And I, at that point, I was caretaking 
for other people's emotions. I don't do that anymore. If someone just dislikes it, it's coming from their own perspective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were talking, me and Ben were talking about this the other day in the car because some, someone had messaged me, you know what I'm talking about, the, the fucking self-righteous little twerp um, that messaged me, tell me I had a tiny heart and I'm coming from the ego. Uh, right. And uh, Ben was like, go, kill him with kindness. Just go back and just be super kind. I'm like, nah, fuck that. He's having it. I don't, I, I, but that's, <laughs> Ben's so much better at like calling. I My, my lid goes. I'm like, nah. He, the guy, the guy is getting it, but also, I know the uh, there's some people that will just go. I just don't get that, Pete. I just he's too fucking intense. Like I just don't get the way he operates. Don't like it. And but there's uh, but I get so many guys that are like I oh, fucking love the intensity that like I I actually need that in my life. So yeah. it's 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 cool. That's and, that, yeah, and yeah. that there is a barometer for me to go. Do you know what? I'm going to lean into the intensity even harder. Because I know that I feel good when I'm doing that. Yeah, that's uh, we could go deeper on that. I think we'll leave mm. that for another time. I am um, leading into the next one, actually, which is uh, we, we, you know, we were talking about um, what you know, Pete's Porsche. We were actually we were like we were, uh, on that conversation. We were talking about this guy had reached out to Pete and talked about his Porsche, and actually one of the conversations we had was like. He bought a Porsche because he loved the Porsche. Like this guy, you know, he talked about Porsches for God knows how long and he could, you know, he want, he bought it because he wanted it. And that's the next point is that guys, guys don't go for what they want because they think it has to be justified. It, they think it has to, there has to be a reason to want what they want. And this is a new concept for me and I'm actually really enjoying it. And actually this is, this, this, this messes with people. Oh, well, you know, why do you want that? Because I want it. And actually, this is something that it is such a new concept. I'm, and I'm actually practicing this myself. It's like I, I drop into trying to justify why I want what I want. Like, why do I want a new Wrangler? I do want a new Wrangler. I, I love the look I of the know, car. I was, a bit, I was literally about to bring that motor up because we spoke yeah, about yeah, yeah. it in, Crete in like <laughs> September. I'm like, I'll get, get the car, man. <laughs> yeah, I'll get the car. I'll get it. I'll definitely get it. Um, it's And it's it's irrational. It's not a logical purchase. It's It's, you know, it's heavy on gas i had one in the uk um it was like a it did like 10 miles to the gallon in the uk you know I, I, and i and actually when it you know when I, when I got divorced i sold it it was not the right car but i'm out here in dubai fuel's cheap love the car and there's if you think about this there's never going to be a real rational reason for wanting what you want at least to another person like for pete for pete having a porsche for me it's a, it's irrational i don't get porsches i'm i'm not a porsche guy can i can you, i say something you like, this, you this like drive it <laughs> no, you fucking drive it and you'd be like oh my yeah. god I, I can understand um this morning i could see the light peering through the blinds I was like, oh it's light outside so undo the blind right on the front of the drive i could just see it just see the the white gt4 glistening and i had a little fucking moment i was like i felt good no it's no one else there it's just literally me and the dog all right leo's not even up yet it's just me and I, had, and I was like fucking hell that looks good yeah I, but that's me it's no one else it's not yeah. it's not on social media it's no nothing and honestly like it gives me that i like i wanted that thing it makes me feel good that's like I get, and i get those moments you can yeah, have those moments then <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, I, but it's never been a Porsche. If you were to say to me, if I, if I had to list out like the top ten cars, I like, Porsche would not come in the top ten. Why? Because I don't I need to justify that either. It's just it's it's totally okay to want one I want, and that's why I don't judge people on their wants. Like I really have got good at that, and like I love that statement. You do you. <laughs> it's just like kind of like yeah. I'm like you do you. Like I, I know I really I really love that statement, but. This is the problem with guys. They 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 think that they need to justify it to their partner, the like the the greater good, the like the the wider world. There needs to be a justification, and I want it needs no because. And like when you get good at this, you'll get better at being able to articulate what you want. Uh, honestly, like for me to say, like I said about wanting the Wrangler, before I got into this practice would have been like, yeah, I want it because, you know, it's fun or it can go on the dunes or it looks cool. And I'm like, I don't know. I've just got this calling to buy one. And I'm, and that's it. That's, that's all I need. And that was, yeah, it's it's been quite a, it's been a really helpful mindset for me. 
<laughs> but we're going to get some messages now from guys. Cheers, men. Fucking missus divorced me. Went out and bought a GT3 yeah. RS. So <laughs> yeah, or, or don't buy a Wrangler in the UK. It's so thirsty. It's so thirsty. I'm, I remember I bought it, and on the first day I beached it trying to go up a, a, a like a like like a, a ramp, and I was like, oh, for like such a wally. Um, anyway, okay, so don't th- you don't need to be justified. And then the final one, and and this is quite an important one, is that you've got out the habit or you've lost your orientation to what you want because you don't have a goal. Like, you know, we talked about it in the first one. You stop setting goals because at some point you told yourself, I I just don't want this pain of, of not achieving what I wanted to achieve. So what's happened then is you've just got lost. And I was talking about this on Heroic Man this morning. So by the way, just a little quick plug for Heroic Man. It's seventeen dollars now, which I think was crazy. We, we dropped the price because we just wanted to get more men to experience what we're talking about. So if you've listened to this podcast, if you've got seventeen dollars, which is the same price as Netflix, and you want fifteen minutes of training every single morning, Pete, myself, and Yasin, we do a fifteen-minute mentoring call. And I was talking on that fifteen-minute mentoring call this morning about orientation to your goal. What's really important about orientation is that. If you've ever done something like a marathon, a 10K, a 5K, you know when it's in the calendar, you start to change your training, you start to think about that that goal and you and you notice as you get closer towards it, you get more intense. Like Pete, maybe I'll talk about this with his jiu-jitsu. I used to have it with running. At certain times of the year, running was way more on my mind. I would get way more intense around my thoughts about what I needed to be doing in my training. It would really sharpen me up. The problem is, is that when we have no goal, we have no orientation to something. We're not moving towards something in our perceived future. So what happens is we lose or like we lose where we are. And that's like being on a on a mountain with no top. And it, it's scary. Like I, I don't know if you've ever walked on a mountain and, and it's the fog set in. When you lose the orientation, it, it's scary. You feel really, really, really lost. And I think that's what happens with a lot of men is they've got no goal, they've got no orientation, and they've also lost momentum. So that is why they get depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation. They are fucking lost. And that is a very, very, very hard place to be. And I've seen a lot of men there. So the fix for this is actually just getting just something. Like what Tony Robbins said this, is like, when you don't know what to do, just do something. Just do, to just have something like a 5K, a 10K, it doesn't need to be the thing that you're going to rest your laurels on or like the, the thing that you achieve in your life. It just needs to be a positive way to move forward. And I can guarantee that doing that thing will get you in forward motion. And like fitness goals are great for this, especially if you're a guy that you're out of shape. Body transformation we've talked about on previous podcasts. And then what happens is you get your orientation back, you get momentum, and then that's when you start to get better at you know, saying what you want. Yeah. Here's the other thing. Let me just add to that on something to do here. And this isn't a plug. Fuck it. It is a plug. It, like, re- reach out to us. I, I, I literally, I've had two guys this week. Pete, I'm feeling a little bit lost. Don't know where I'm going. Um, can, we, can we chat? Or it doesn't have to be us. It might, it might be someone else that you're following. No, reach, really out with. No, reach out to us, Pete. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm, in, all, in all fucking seriousness, yeah. if you, it's like get 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 on the right path. Sort get some fitness out. Get a get a goal, and then just and reach out to someone that can help you. We're very yeah. very very good at it because we've we've done this now for three years. Thousands of guys that listen that listen to our work in our in our groups that we help with all this stuff. We're good at it. Get a mentor. Get a coach. Yeah, and I do. I think you know, I'm I'm very, very aligned with saying reach out to us. I think we're better than a lot of men at what we do because Pete is incredible at operationalizing goals and visions. Like literally, he's got a almost like a what's the word for it? He's got a is a is a, de- is a defect. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I understand the matrix. <laughs> the guy, the guy sees in the matrix, and I and I'm like amazing at helping you take the step in front of you, like. Um, and, and between the two of us and you're seeing that there's a, there's a real powerhouse of of guys that can help you first of all get your get your goal get the orientation to the goal and take those next steps so it, it's a really important process to get through and, and if you're listening to this and you are lost reach out don't struggle 
in that space for too long. It's not a healthy place to be. And uh, now Pete um, I was mentioning to me the other day, like, and I've had the same thing. Guys reaching out saying, "Listen, I'm really, really struggling emotionally." And it's when you hear a guy talk about that, I'm almost like straight away. I know what's going on. They've just lost that orientation to their goal they don't know where they're going in life things aren't going the way they want it to go and they start to be nihilistic in the way that they see life it's like oh it's got no point and that's one of the most dangerous places to be as a man so there are the they're the, the five key things i think are coming up for me recently and like why you're struggling to articulate what you want and if you've enjoyed it feel free to reach out to us after the podcast continue the conversation uh, please like and subscribe. Honestly, you know, the more likes, subscriptions we get, the better the guests we can get and uh, serve you guys powerfully. Thank you so much for listening. Cheers, Dane.